I just want to uh, share with you uh, briefly this morning kind of a connecting message that will kind of kick off more of the messages on uh, relationships, improving our connections. And uh, as we uh, go through that series over the next couple of weeks, we are going to beginning kind of today with the central person of relationships, then kind of moving into how to live a successful single life and then move into finding the right life partner, some messages on marriage. Uh, I'm even having a message how to have a good fight, uh, some communication stuff. There's going to be a number of things around this um, and it will also be very helpful to all of us generally in the church because we are one big family. And so there will be a number of messages around that. This morning I want to take you though to Colossians chapter 3 and uh, the version I'm reading with it has the caption there rules for holy living. I don't really like that caption at the top of the NIV uh, there because really what this uh, passage talks about is how you and I can live the resurrection life. And because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, the Apostle Paul lives, or actually lays out some great principles that we're going to look at briefly this morning to kind of set up everything about uh, this relationship series. And when our connection is close to Christ, uh, it is an incredible thing, and it helps us through the relationships on the human scale. So I'm just going to read uh, first, the first few verses there in Colossians chapter 3. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Down to verse 12. Therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have had against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Father, bless our time in Your Word today. Be our teacher by Your Holy Spirit. Help us to apply these important truths to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been in a place or in a room or maybe it's a meeting where one person wants to be the center of attention? Maybe it's a family gathering and every time you get together that one person is doing most of the talking, most of the joking. They're just the center of attention in the room. Have you ever been there before? Okay. No, uh, this is excluding me right now, okay? <laughs> All right? But it's a very interesting phenomenon. In fact, it's gone to an extreme recently. Gwen showed me that now there is a trend about selfies out there where young women and sometimes young men are making sure their makeup is all right for the selfies that they're going to take in the afternoon. They, uh, you can go online and you can find out a, about an 8 to 15 minute interview of somebody just getting ready to take selfies. Now some of you who don't have cell phones, I, I'm sorry for you because you don't get to do this. But you can go around and this is what's happening now. People are just kind of putting their phone up and they're taking pictures of themselves. But they want to make sure they're looking good in order to take selfies. One young woman who was interviewed said, I take about 2,000 selfies of myself every day. Every day. 
But I always make sure in the morning and at noon and in the afternoon when I'm with my friends, my makeup is really good. Now, some of you who are on my Facebook page could use a little bit of makeup, I think, okay, when you're taking selfies. But do you notice selfies have gotten away? Remember in the old days when people had to pay for all their film and development? They were very careful about the pictures they took. Usually they were group pictures, family pictures, not so many individualistic pictures, but now it's like because of electronics and that, you can take thousands of pictures. In fact, one young man was interviewed, said that on Snapchat, he usually has kind of 3,000 chats a day with people through that media. Isn't it amazing? And what it has become and moved us to is a much more self-centered society. Much more self-centered. Last week we looked at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it changes everything. And I mean, when, when we understand the resurrection of Jesus, and as Gwen was sharing this a little bit earlier, I mean, we, we take this time on the Easter weekend to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but it doesn't stop there because when Christ is the center of our lives, I mean, it transforms our whole life every day, every week, every month, and every year of our life when we come to know him. Because when Jesus Christ is the center of our life, he makes such a big difference in, in our relationships. He makes them healthy when our focus is on Him, when He is the center of our life. Uh, I want to go on record right now that when we come to worship and praise God together, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about the worship team. It's not about the sound guys. It's not about the children's ministry. It's about God. It's about Jesus Christ. That, that's why we gather here together. And, and, and when we, we, we come together in that way, we become more occupied with Jesus Christ being at the center of our life. Because if you're going to truly live the, the risen life, and notice what the Apostle Paul writes here. He says, since then you've been raised with Christ. You've been transformed by Christ. You have a relationship with Christ. He gives us kind of these things in order for us to keep having him at the center of our life. The center of our life. It doesn't really matter how good you are on a selfie. Okay? Uh, it's really, is, is Christ the center of your life? To be preoccupied with Christ in your work, in your family, in your relationships. And notice what Paul says here. He says, first of all, set your heart on Jesus Christ. Set your heart on Jesus Christ. What's the heart? The heart is our inner life, our self. Our, it's our intention. It's our, our will. What, what Paul is saying here is set your life, set your heart like Christ. Let your focus on Jesus determine your earthly responses to whatever is happening in your life, in my life. And notice something else. He paints a picture for us here. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's a powerful picture. I mean, it has deep meaning. It has, it has also deep kind of universal meaning because it shows that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, shows his equality with God, shows that he is God, shows that he is all authority in each of our lives when we surrender or set our hearts on him. It's an incredible picture. That helps set our hearts on Christ. When we understand that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is the creator of the universe. He is seated there in all of his authority. So if you want to start setting your heart right with Christ, picture Jesus seated this way. He's seated this way. Focus on heavenly values. You know, it's so important. 
And in 1 Chronicles, it goes back there to 1 Chronicles 22, 19. It says, now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. Right? I mean, Jesus picks that theme up in Matthew 6 as well. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But you have to seek him first. He's got to be the center of our life, our thinking, our devotion, our inner life. I was talking to someone this morning. I said, how are you doing? They said, just amazing. I feel awesome this morning. I'm going, only Jesus can do that, that early on a Sunday morning. Right? It's amazing, right? So set your heart on Jesus Christ. But notice what he says here in verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will appear with him in glory. How many of you have heard the phrase, they're so heavenly minded they're no earthly good? Okay? People who say that usually have a problem with heavenly minded people, don't you think? I, I think what they really are saying is, I want to live my life my own way and I don't want to live with Christ as the center of my life. And they're judging other people who maybe pray, worship, and are, are just allowing their life to be centered in Christ. They, they see Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory. They see him as the person that they have to set their mind on. And this is what, what happens here. Paul says, if you want to live and experience the resurrection life, not only are you to set your, your heart on Jesus Christ as I have, he says, set your mind on Jesus Christ. To think like Christ and to renew your mind, right? Remember what it says in Philippians uh, chapter 4 and verse 8. Uh, it says here, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what's he say? Think about these things. When Jesus Christ comes into your life and mine, our thinking changes. It's to change. It's, it's to be Christ-honoring because so much of what is bombarded bombards us day in and day out from the media and other places basically gets us off track. The other night I I was on uh, cartrader.ca I think it was or and I'm, I and I thought I'm just going to put in there to see if there's a truck that's for sale. Well, do you know how many trucks are for sale on that site? 3,000 of them. And I just start kind of thumbing through because I, I tell Gwen, you know, the next vehicle I'd like is a truck. And she goes, no, you're not having a truck. <laughs> And I'm dreaming about trucks. I'm seeing this is one truck in my neighborhood. It's a bright red truck, brand new truck. I'm not going to be able to afford a brand new truck like that. But I see that truck all the time. I'm in Toronto. I still see the same truck. It doesn't matter, right? Because my thinking has been focused on maybe trucks too much. And then I come to my senses after a half an hour and go, I've wasted a half an hour looking at a bunch of trucks. And I've only watched 2,200 of them. Right? And I realize it's kind of a waste of time. A waste of time. And I apologize to the Lord because, you see, I, I, I was just going to read my Bible for a while. But I saw an email, and that got me in. You know, one thing leads to another, and oh, a squirrel, and you know, stuff like that with me. And, and I missed out on some time. But when we set our mind on Jesus Christ, we renew our mind. Remember the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 talks about that very clearly, right? In, in order for us to have godly thinking, heavenly thinking, God-honoring thinking, our minds need to be renewed. Sometimes we get so caught up in the arguments that the world throws our way, when, when, when the, the, the things kind of come at us, we hear reports, we hear this, we hear that. And really what we need to do is spend more time allowing God just to speak into our life. 
And do not conform, verse 2 of Romans 12 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, what? By the renewing of your mind. Our thinking changes when Jesus, we set our hearts on Jesus. Our thinking changes when we start thinking His thoughts. And, and it says here, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we, because we have been given the mind of Christ, the moment we come to Jesus, we are given His mind. But by faith, every day, we just have to yield to His thinking in order for us to, to get out of the, the, the problems of getting sidetracked in our thinking in what we do. Notice something else here in verses 5 to 11. Uh, th this in, in Corinthians chapter, or Colossians rather, chapter 3 is an important thing to look at because Paul really says, you know what, if you have set your, your heart on Jesus Christ and, and, and you're committed to Christ and you understand His greatness and who He is, then you're, you're setting your mind on Christ, then as a result of that, it's not just knowing about the truth of Christ, it's not just knowing the good doctrine about Jesus. No, it, it, it transforms your whole life. And so he says, set your lifestyle on Jesus Christ. So notice what he says here in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is adultery. Idolatry, rather. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Notice he says here, if you continue in these kinds of sins, his wrath is coming. His judgment is coming. And, and we're seeing God's judgment more and more in people's lives today. Just because we've gotten away from setting our hearts on Christ and setting our minds on Christ. And as there have been people that I've counseled over the years, they've said to me, well, Robin, you know what? This sin is not that bad. And I go, how come things aren't working for you? You know? And I kind of break into kind of, you know, the television psychologist guy, you know him, who basically says, how's that working for you? And they go, well, not really too well. So you can't, you can't be saying you're a follower of Christ and kind of living like the devil and think that there's nothing going to harm or affect your family, your relationships, even your work, all of these kinds of things. We're to set our lifestyle on Jesus Christ, put to death the earthly nature. And actually he says here, he says in verse 8, but now rid yourselves of all such things, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. I mean, I mean, he kind of covers it all. He covers kind of the actions of sins, the, the, the attitude of sins, and even the, the, the speech of sin or sinful speech. And he says, these things have to go. Do not lie to each other, he says. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices... And he, he kind of comes into this metaphor. He says, you used to have this stuff on. But now if you know Jesus, you're transformed. Things are not the same. It's kind of like going to the store. And uh, I like buying new things, but Gwen makes sure I buy new things cheap. Okay? There's nothing like a new shirt, a new pair of pants. Okay? There's nothing like it to me. Okay? Because the old stuff is kind of worn out, right? And, and, the, and the, world, the world system and what it does to us just wears it out. But when Jesus comes into our life, when we're setting our hearts on Him, our minds on Him, our lifestyle on Him, He just makes things fresh. I love what my oldest son said to me a few years ago when I had a new shirt for Sunday morning. He said, Dad, that looks so fresh. Fresh. And that's what Jesus does in our life. He makes things fresh. I mean, remember in some old youth groups, they would always take a picture. And they had to have three people. So, you know, there, were, there was no selfies in this. Where basically they said, what? See no evil? Hear no evil? Speak no evil? And there would be somebody there, three people. Usually three girls in grade 11. That's what I remember. And that was their deal. 
And, and I always thought there was something more that had to be there. And basically, that's do no evil. And that's kind of like this. Don't do it. Do no evil. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 5 says to us. I mean, there's so many verses that connect with this message today and just help us kind of build towards these messages on family and marriage and, and relationships within the church. But it says here in verse, in verse 21 in particular, or actually verse 19, it says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Do you want to put out the Spirit's fire in your life more than anything else in your life? When you hear the Word of God and somebody preaching the Word of God and you just say, well, that's really not for me. And just put it aside. You, you just continue to put out the Spirit fire in your life. But notice what he says here. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. A couple weeks ago, I posted something on Facebook and on my Twitter account where I, I basically said that those who killed the, those Christians in Pakistan were evil. Did you know I offended somebody by saying that? It wasn't an, a Muslim. It wasn't someone from a mainline denomination. It was a friend of mine who's a theologian. And we got into a kind of a discussion. He messaged me, and I said, don't you think it was evil? Well, yeah, I know, but Robin, you shouldn't really say stuff like that because you might offend somebody. And I'm saying, you know what? I'm tired in the world saying that evil is good and good is evil. And we've let that happen, and no one says anything. So what does he say next? That's so important. Well, not only are we to kind of set our hearts on Christ, not only are we to, to set our minds on Christ and our lifestyle on Jesus Christ, we're to set our character on Jesus Christ. That's what 12, verses 12 to 17 is really all about. See, there's a change that happens when Jesus comes into my life. I mean, he calls us chosen, holy, and dearly loved. When God says that to people, that's a transforming thing. That when we come to know Jesus, we're chosen by Him. We're holy, made holy, and dearly loved. And we're to clothe ourselves with what? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. And this is, he's writing to us as believers. Forgive whatever grievances you have. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And then put on love which binds them all to, uh, together in perfect unity. We can speak the truth in love. We can call evil, evil. We can call good, good. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and then it says here, let the word of God, Christ, dwell in you richly. Because what happens with the Word of God, it, it does some things in our life. It helps to clothe us with the right things or the righteousness of Christ so that our confession one to another, our forgiveness one to another, the peace that comes to us through Christ, and the thankfulness that comes as a result. When things change, when, when, when people, people move on in their lives, we, we can just bring peace into those situations. We, we can bring thankfulness into those situations. Because notice what Paul, how he concludes this kind of pericope or this passage of Scripture. And he says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. People were taught hundreds of years ago that the center of the solar system was the earth. And everything revolved around the earth. For 1,300 years, that theory went on until it was finally proved to be an illusion. Copernicus said the sun is the center and everything in our particular part of the universe goes around that. You know, I know some Christians who are still living in that polemic illusion 
that either they are the center of the universe, but they're not. The Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the center. He is everything. And, and my hope this morning as we come around the Lord's table in a few moments is that He is the center of your life. The center of your heart. Your inner life with Him. Your prayer life with Him. Your thinking, the mind, the, your lifestyle, your character. You're set on Christ. I hope we are living in the heavenlies. That we are heavenly minded. Christ centered minded. Because it's the only vantage point from which you and I can really touch the world. Because when Christ is, is at the center of our life, I can tell you very honestly, it is so countercultural to what everything else is in our culture. See, we're still the people that still love the unborn. We're, we're the people that speak about it because we see that each child is, is, is a creation of God. We, we, we are still the people that are talking about it, and we must get louder in this country, that at the end of life we still care and help people die a natural death. And everybody in between. Because we're created in God's image. And, and, and so in these days where we don't see the other centeredness and, and we see kind of the, the Facebook stuff and, and um, the selfies, my hope is that we would find Christ at the center because that will make all the difference in all of our relationships. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, pray this morning, we thank you for your grace. As we come around the Lord's table now, we just ask, Lord, that you would guide us and direct us. Help each one of us, Father, to reflect even in these moments around your table today about setting our hearts on you, our minds on you, our lifestyles on you, and our character on the character of Christ. So I pray by your Holy Spirit you would move in each one of our hearts today and guide, guide us as we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen.